First and foremost, I'm really glad to be here. Uh, it's always nice to be asked to share things, and uh, I think it was important that uh, I got some really good inputs from, um, from one of my biggest mentors, was Dick Bate, who uh, a lot of people will know a lot of his, his stuff. But when I was asked to uh, about a title, um, Steve just gave me, gave me a title, which was uh, Playgrounds and Stadium. Um, and obviously there's different ways you can do it. You can do it from a player's point of view, or you can do it from a coach's point of view. In this, at this moment in time, obviously I'm a coach who has had uh, a lot of different roles. So I'm looking at it really uh, with a little bit of an integrated view, uh, and really a personal view from, from, from where I am now. Uh, and, and we'll go through a little bit of the journey. So, first and foremost, while you're, stand, while you're sitting in there, can you think or write what your ultimate football job is. So I know it would be different for, different for people um, at different ages or different stages or different likes, but could you write that? And we'll come, we'll come back to it um, towards the end of the, of, the, of, the, of the talk. Okay, so first and foremost, what is your perception of peak? Right, what, is your, what is your perception of peak in your career? If you were to get to where you think this is the best that you can get, or this is a long look the way you can get, what would it be? Alright, so think about that. Okay? So is it this? Okay? Is your perception of peak working alongside people you consider to be the best? Working on in a situation when you're on TV, you got pressure, you, you're working with the best players that you can at that time in your career? Or is it this? Is it this? Is this? Would this be your perception of peak? Where you're working with people, future players, future stars of, um, of the Premier League, future uh, England players, is this your perception of peak? So we have to decide, if you're going to go from the playground to the pitch, what pitch are you going to play? So, let's give you a little basic outline of some roles that I've done, okay? So, I was... Uh, I finished here in this country around about 28, I had a bad injury, and I went to Malta and I became a player manager. Probably the hardest job you're ever going to do. Because you're dictating to people from the side. When you dictate to people from the side about playing, you, you're thinking they take it all in and they do it to how you would like to, and you get frustrated. When you're dictating your own plan and you're having to carry it out, and a lot of the time you're not carrying it out, you will find that that is one of the biggest and most difficult things you can do. Imparting knowledge on, on people and actually doing it yourself is very, very difficult. It's probably the hardest role I've had. Okay? Women's football. Worked in women's football. So if you're a coach, uh, and this is still on my journey to the pitch, to from the playground, you're a coach, your communication has to change depending on your audience and depending on the people that you're working with. Okay, so I did women's football, uh, new ladies back in uh, blimey, 1998 to two, three seasons I did it for. And then, so when people talk about oh, I've done women's football, they might have taken the odd team. Now this is a proper league, three seasons, one of the first times it came, came out. Played against uh, Millwall Lionesses when they were, they were the, the, the top team. Jim Hicks, who was at PFA, was in charge then, and so on and so on. And this, this, this job, Alex Welsh, who was works for the London FA, helped to get me the job, was one of the biggest insight into my communication and how I dealt with the difference and different people at that time. Okay? Uh, Coco Expo, that was a, a job in America that I did before the MLS. Uh, before the MLS came, uh, there, was, there, was, there was a head coach there and a player coach as well. Uh, we got to the national final, it, it, it was a very big deal in, in, in those days. Now, a lot of people don't know this, I was assistant manager at Luton um, for about three or four months when I was about 36, 37. Very, very, very trying time, very difficult time. Uh, um, learned a lot, a lot about not changing things too quickly. Fortunately, I got that job after I worked at the FA, 
and at that time, I'm actually a fitness person, so I'm actually more more a fitness person than I'm a football football person. So, wrote the fitness award for the FA at the time, and tried to imp implement a lot of uh, modern ideas into an old school team. So, cool downs, stretching, eating the right thing, all that sort of thing. That job lasted. I was assistant manager Ricky Hill. That job lasted. I actually went before Ricky. So that's how much they didn't want to be moved into the, into the new into the new times. So I did that. Barnet about philosophy. We talk about philosophies. I've been very very fortunate with some of my jobs to go around the world, looking at uh, Real Madrid, Barcelona's, Portos, uh, New York Red Bulls, wherever you, wherever it is. I've I've, I've been into that. Area arena and seeing different people of different heights. But the most I learned about philosophy was John Still. John Still, although you might look at the style of play that I'd like to play and the way that John has been known to play, we're miles apart, but actually instilling a philosophy and sticking to it, I learned more from him than I've learned probably from, from most people. Because everything he does lives, breathes, his philosophy, how he trains, what he does, every single thing. I'll give you a little anecdote. We played, uh, I was moonlighting from another job when I was doing that. I did that for, for nothing for six months. Uh, and that was after I left Luton. I had a job in between, which I'll go past you'll see later on. I've taken the reserve team, did a kick off, kid done it, played it wide. He walks around, John, he was late to the game. Just take him off, take that expedient off. I said, why? He said, well, he might play Saturday, and I don't want him to do that. And if he does that, and they score, I'm the one on the back pages of the, the newspaper. And little things like that, I know it might have been harsh, but, but obviously, when you're, when you're working in a first-team environment, you have to make sure whatever you, you impart, that the players do, and sometimes getting your, getting your word over, or getting the, 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 the thing over, has to be done in a way that makes the players realise that you're serious. So I've learned a lot about philosophy for him. Charleston Battery was a team that I played uh, 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 as uh, the American football, the soccer in, in America, evolved. I went to America for four years. Uh, and in the time I went there, the there was only 10 MLS club teams, and there was USL, which is, which is the next league down. And it's all franchises. So the teams were comparable, but the franchises were a lot of money. But I went there for four years, won the national championship, fortunately. Learned a lot about working with, um, with different players. So I was there in 2001. And in this country, in those days, foreign players were, were here, but not everybody had them. So, Learning how to work with people from Paraguay and Trinidad and Brazil and Mexico and stuff like that was very, very enlightening to me about also evolving me as a coach and as a person. Now, I would say I was a very horrible man in those days because most of the way that I communicated was harsh and it was very command all the time. So, uh, if I look back then, I probably would cringe at some of the, some of the things that I did. But also, pressure gets you to act in different ways. And some of the things I did there, I think were, were, were very good. But part of your involvement. I worked at Tottenham for 10 years. And eventually, towards the end of my time there, I became the first team coach with Tim Sherwood and Les Ferdinand. Very, very important time in my development. A very, very important time in my confidence in, the, in, in understanding what level I could coach at and working with players at a level, world class level. And obviously, when you coach players, they're either having you or they're not having you. And if you coach players and you coach them in a way that you believe is right and you affect them in a way that you believe is right, it's a big boost for your, for your confidence and for, your, for, your, for where you become your journey. QPR manager, uh, time, sliding doors moment. 
went there as a head of player development. Uh, within three months, uh, went there in, in, in November. In fe by February, I, I was interim manager, and uh, fortunately they gave, they gave me a job. And a very difficult time, but very, uh, I wouldn't say it's a peak in my career, but if you start off in football community and you end up coaching the Premier League, it's quite, it's quite a big journey. And, and, and you learn a lot along, along the way, and a lot of the stuff that's happened to me put me in good stead for, for the job. At the moment, I'm head of coaching at QPR and technical director. So, the technical director, a bit of my, um, excuse me, that's a fine, my own self. Technical director bit of my job means that I'm actually in charge of all the technical work at, at the club, which sees me working with every team. So I work with every team from the nines to the first team. So uh, that came about because our head coaching left um, the academy and he went to Notts Forest as the assistant manager. I took that job over. And then our first team coach left and went to Middlesbrough and the club obviously didn't want to bring somebody else in and pay them more money and they thought I was capable of working with Ian Holloway. So now I, 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 I went there and worked with Ian Holloway for six months. I've just worked with Steve McLaren for all season so I can get everyone to sack to me. So, <laughs> so now uh, Mark Warburton's coming and I'm hoping that we have five years together because that five years I think will be very important for our development. Okay. So, a lot of you might have seen this. You've seen the first team. Kieran McKenna and Matt Wells. So, a lot of people think, I'll go and do a great job with the youth team and I'll go and work with the first team. I see that a lot. Now, having been at the top of 10 years and gone through a lot of coaches, seen a lot of young coaches, and being at my present club, I see the way that some of the way that people coach young teams and they think that if they win every game in the under 14s or the under 13s, they're going to the next minute be working in the first team. That, that is, that those two, two players came through the coaching system at Tottenham and formed, I would say, friendships and networked appropriately and obviously drew the confidence in the people that picked, that picked it. But this is rare. <coughs> so if you think you're going to go from coaching a youth team to one day working there in, in, in no time, it's rare. Okay. So where so where where so where where are you? We're talking about where do you think you are? Are you a, are you a first team coach? Or are you a development coach? So even the biggest players, if we look at we take an example from other countries, very, very rarely do people, no matter who they are, go from the pitch straight to the first team. In this country, in some respects, sometimes your profile gives you that, that one or two straight to the first team. We look at Holland as one of the countries, and we have someone, one of the most famous players, who will learn his trade actually coaching. Yeah. Actually learn his trade, working with players, developing players. Uh, I, would say, I would say just making mistakes, because I think a lot of the times what they do, they buddy them up with somebody, an old person who probably has been through it, or, or a young person who has more empathy for the players. And that those coaches develop their craft before going into the, into, into, into the first team environment. So, in order to do that, you need credible flexibility. So what I mean by that, to sit on both benches there, you're, you have to be credible, you have to be flexible, you have to be credible in, on both benches. So, when you're taking a first team, a first team uh, session, have you got the credibility to coach the players? Do, they, do you affect the players or do they work how you would want them to work? Do the players see you as the manager? Now, to sit on the other bench, on the other side, a lot of the times people go from coaching a first team or being a first team player and think that just because they've got knowledge that they can work on the other bench. And sometimes your, cred your credibility will only last as long as the players are effective and understand what you're doing. So, 
Credible flexibility, I would say, for most of us, is probably going to be the most important thing, especially if you want to go from the, the, the bench on this side to the bench on the other side. So if you haven't got that, you're going to find it very difficult to, to coach older players or to coach first teams. Now, one of the things I always talk to, I talk to the coaches that, that work with me, there are only 92 jobs associated with first team. Now, not, it's 92 managers' jobs, 92 assistant managers' jobs, 92 sports science jobs, 92 head physios, etc. So if you're involved in the first team, there's only 92 of your job, your particular job. There's only 92 of those jobs. So it's probably seeing more people on the bus this morning. Really. Okay? So if you're not involved in one of them, by definition, you're in the development arena. So if you're not one of the 92 people, you are a developer. That is what you are. You're in the development arena. So, therefore, right, for me, in my 41 years of, of, playing, of playing and coaching, uh, and maybe, I don't know, maybe 20, 20, 30 years have been involved in coaching. 10 years of my coaching has been the first thing. 20 years of it would have been, would have been the development. So, a lot of people look at you working the first thing and they think, oh, how do we get there? But it's important to realise that if you are, are these people the best people, people to emulate? in their role now. Are these the, the people? So everyone I hear when they speak about um, <coughs> I, I'll go now, that was a coach they played this morning, the game this morning. So I'll go in and listen on the on, on in the back of the, the room. Oh he done that so we dropped in there and he put, did this and this and that and I saw this pet do that and I saw Benga do that and I saw Conti do that. Are these the best are these the best role models in the games? We all know this picture, don't we? Yeah? We know this picture, we all know these people. Yeah? Plus, the most successful bunch of youth team players from one club, probably in the history of the game. Do we know this person? If he was walking down the road, would we know? No. Do we know this person? Do we know this person? Do we know this person? So, in order to get to the, to the, to the box right at the top, it's important that we understand that not everybody who's famous is effective. Just because people are famous and we all know them, they're not always the people that put people where they need to be. So, I'm sure in all clubs there are versions of these people in all football clubs. So it's, who do you want to be? I told you before about the 92, the nine, it's only 92, uh, it's only 92 people, people in development, in uh, first team football. But these people have got, uh, as long as they have longevity, a lot of the time we will produce blacks. But we have to decide as ourselves, where do we sit? in the grand scheme of things. So therefore, when we look at working with, with players, we work really on, a, uh, on an individual basis. You look back at the team at the top here, like I said to you, that's rare. That, that doesn't happen. In my lifetime, I've heard that, not, that hasn't happened in this country. So it's not happened. We had great amounts of players that, uh, like your club, West Ham, we're getting Rios and Joe Coles and Frank Lampard and stuff like that. But it very, very, really happens when a whole youth team plays in the first game. So, what, we, what as a coach, what we try to do, or what I've tried to in, in, in implement at my club, <coughs> comes before is an, a, an individual basis, working with players as an individual, because the team doesn't go through. So. If you ever see any of my slides, these are standard slides for me. Okay, so we have a commitment to the players. 
to provide an opportunity for them to succeed through a training program that addresses individual needs and a games program that allows for maximal uh, opportunity for the players to develop. So, our um, 15s played the other night against West Ham. Now, we got learners because they were a very good team, they were better players, better organised, better individuals, and uh, they played to the, bit to the philosophy of their club. Of their club. Now, could have quite easily sat for, sat in, uh, went to 4 4 2, sat in 4 0 or 3 0, and let them play in front and just went for Daniel's limitation. No point. That's not, that, that would not have developed the individual. That would have been a games program that is more for me than it is for them because I don't want to be embarrassed. So, what positives can I take out of that? Well, we had a set of mid player that I thought is one of our best players, and he carried out the actions that he that will help him to get a scholarship in in, in, in the future. He told me about the centre half not not being able to to, to work one v one when he gets quick forward. What plans do I put in place for him to succeed in the future? But I have to take that result. Well, not me only. Our academy have to take that result on the chin for the player, for the group of players. Now, in a year's time, when we play them again and we come to scholarships, if there are four players that get scholarships or five players that get scholarships out of that same group, then we would have had a level of success because we would learn what to do in order to move those players forward. Because it does, just, just because we have uh, 16 players, they don't, failure isn't when you, when people, only when people don't get success. Failure is when you're, you, you, you don't do the best for the players. Sometimes doing for the best for the player means that they sometimes they hit a ceiling. But if nobody out of that group gets a scholarship next, like, uh, next season, it means that we haven't taken the proper action to, to rectify um, what they need. Now, obviously, our, our job, when you go to a football club, right, um, and, and uh, first thing, you get the job with the aim of producing players for your first thing. Your commitment to the player is to make sure that if he doesn't play for your first thing, he goes to another club, similar or higher, or another, another league club. So you're hoping that you know, they're going to they're pay their bills. We, we believe anybody who pays their bills or has a financial contribution to their life is an expert. Because when you look at that, the, we talk about the academy is 1%, 1%. We actually forget how little that is. Overseas opportunities. We've had uh, players that have gone to America, gone to, to France, gone to Sweden, and, and places like that, and played there. Um, education is the most important. So that comes first. So if our players are not excelling to their level in the education, we don't, we don't, we either don't take them on, or we don't, um, or we give them help. But the education is important because we realise how difficult it is for players to make it. So that is very, very important. And also, when you're dealing with full-time players, they can go to other countries, they can go to America and get a scholarship and have a different life experience. And then we support them for other alternative careers. Last, uh, two weeks ago, or no, three weeks ago, we had a, uh, a player came to me, I worked with a Tottenham, I released him at 15, and, get, and uh, he said to me, the advice that the club gave him at the time about, right, you're a very clever boy, Maybe you should push on with your with your your uh, your studies. So it's the best advice ever. Now he, he he was standing next to me as the, as the club doctor that day. So very 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 important that we give people advice that are appropriate and that we use football as a life experience rather than a, 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 a narrow um, experience that can crush people when they have got other things in their life. Now we talked about. Um, Respecting the journey, and this is where I think a lot of the young coaches that we have don't respect the journey that it will take to get to where you need to get to. So 
We talk about the smooth sea that never made a skilled sailor. So there's going to be ups and downs in, 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 what, in what you do. One of the biggest things that I find work, uh, working with an academy and working with the, the, the coaches is if I take the under 12s coach and move him to the under 10s, they'll see that as a demotion. All the coaches that we've got up the time the 16 get paid the same. Under 9s, under 16s, they get paid the same. Because they're all the same for me. It just means that everyone, people are different experts, expertise at different ages and different levels. So we don't say, right, the under, the under 16 coach can't tell the under 9 coach what to do just because he's being with, being with older players. They're the same. They're all the same. So, these are some of mine. We talk about respect the journey, right? Which is, I think, is very important to get you to where you need to be. So to get me to be high-fiving with Mourinho, there's a journey that has to get there for you to get there. Okay, so these are some of my tips, some of my tips. I'm going to whisk for them because there's a few. Football community, when I first came back from Malta, probably taught me more about coaching than any course or any situation that I've been in. And that's international football, whatever it may, 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 may be. It's probably taught me more than anything. So when you're, so when you're dealing with, at the moment, you go to a football community in any club. We're talking about from Oxford to Newcastle. There'll be things things nowadays are put are proper. Everyone's got the right equipment, you've got the right amount of balls, you've got the right amount of bibs, you've got the right areas, the right lines on the pitch. Before you were given some bibs and two or three balls when the pattern's coming off and you've got twenty kids, you've got one tall, big, strong one, you've got one small one. You've got the kid with the patch on, on his eye with the glasses. You've got the little girl who, who's just starting off. You've got the girl who's good. You've got the kid who's overweight. And you were just given a mixture of that's just your group. And you, so you're there now from 9 o'clock to 4 o'clock. And you've got to keep those kids entertained. And the reason why you know they're entertained is not only for the babysitting, it's because they want to come back. Women's football in the US and, and, and uh, America. Youth Development Officer at Lake Norian for three years um, back, back in the day. Uh, <coughs> stupidly thought I was uh, packed in those days into changing and all that. We used to get murdered, but we got players into the first team. Uh, we ended up with Nicky Shaw, we ended up as an England international. So, you know, sometimes, a lot of times coaching for myself, a lot of those, but quite early on I had the, the, the thing of the individual and I'm not worrying too much about the result. That doesn't mean that I don't want to win. It just needs it's just where what arena I'm in. Okay? Biggest, steepest learning curve, um, apart from some of the, the player manager and, and, and things like that, throughout I went to the uh, regional director for the FA. Regional director for the FA in those days. Five regions. That's all there was, five regions, five regional directors. All the stuff that, 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 all the support that you see now wasn't the same. So what you had was one person for one region and you ran everything. From the scouting, to the courses, to uh, the CPD for the clubs. The only way the clubs do their individual CPD wasn't done like that. It was done like this. Or, uh, all, you'd have 10 clubs would come, they'd all sit in a the theatre, then they'd all go out, you, you was in charge of it. You'd have to put sessions on, you'd have to employ people to do it, and, and, and. But what it done was it allowed me to become an international manager. So, work in England, England, all the England teams, from 16 to under 20. So, I've worked with all those, with, with all those teams. So, that's helped me, that helped me a lot to understand about international football. Um, national coach in the 20s, assistant, uh, so, while I was an assistant coach, with the likes of Harold Lucas and Nes Reed and, and a lot of other people, you pick up things from experienced managers. Uh, not all good, because sometimes they make mistakes, and you pick up from that. And so it's not being negative about mistakes that people make. It's about understanding how they solve them and 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 and, and uh, pick up, with, but, but using your own personality to help you out to to uh, grasp the knowledge. Um, coach educated 
so I've, 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 I've worked doing the full, the full badges, I've worked on the pro license and all that, all that sort of stuff. I'm actually the school teacher. So uh, I'm a primary school teacher initially, and then a secondary school teacher. Um, I evolved into that after I did, I did uh, my, my masters. So the school teaching was akin to the footballing community. It's akin to the first football community, yeah. community. When you coach in the academy, the players want to be there. So it's easier to get their attention. When you go into a school, primary school teaching is difficult in one way because you're dealing with young, young kids and you really have to understand. Trying to teach a five-year-old to sing when you can't sing yourself is very difficult. You know, trying to use you on the painting and all that sort of stuff. Very, very... Uh, if you ever got a chance to go and teach in the primary school for a month, do it. Because what happens is the lessons change all the time. That's why I enjoyed it more in secondary school, where you're teaching sports science all day or something like that. But one of the things about, about that is you will learn about ensuring that the kids get what they need to get, even when they don't need to be there. They don't want to be there. They have to be there. So imparting your knowledge and making sure that they pass their SATs and stuff like that is a test in itself, probably a bigger test than you'll ever get when you're working uh, coaching kids in, in an academy. Because you have to you have to make sure their attention is there. Disability football, I don't think I was very good at it, but you tried, tried to, to, to do it. Another way of getting uh, uh, involved in your communication. It's another way of involving your communication because you are totally, totally, totally out of your out of your depth. Totally out of your depth unless you have unless you've been a carer or unless you work with somebody that, that or, or you have a family member or you've worked with people who who, who you had the difficulties uh, um, communicating with. We can all say, yeah, no, I was really good. No, I wasn't very good, but I tried. Adult education, like that goes with that, that saying, saying the university lecturing, uh, university football. So, one of my roles was to work at, uh, when, I, when I worked in America, my, uh, just after Malta, was I, I worked at uh, Florida Tech University for a fall. I did their, did their, their another rounded experience working in the university football, understanding how the culture works there. Understanding about uh, rich kids, rich kids who some of them get scholarships, some of them don't. The ones who don't get scholarships, probably a lot of their parents are millionaires. So asking them to track back is similar to asking some of the players now in, 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 the, in the Premier League who've got money, who I wouldn't say have fallen out of love with football, but it's very, very difficult to motivate. Director of football in, in America, uh, assistant uh, academy manager at Tottenham Rack. Massive, massive change and catalyst. I was in America uh, as director of football in, in, in Fort Myers. Fort Myers is on the Gold Coast of Florida, absolutely fantastic. But you can only go to the beach so many times. You can only enjoy your cocktail so many times. Un Unemployed at that, at that stage, unassimilated. John McDermott phoned me up and said, can you go, can, do you want to come to Tottenham? He was at the FA at the time, I've known him a long time. I went there as his assistant and evolved a philosophy, a development philosophy that they're reaping, reaping the benefits for it, for it now. Uh, Tim Sherwood and Les Clark then came in. I went from doing 9 to 16s to doing their development squad with them as Tim's assistant and, 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 and with Les. Head of player development, so as these jobs evolved and people changed and moved, head of player development at Tottenham, um, head of, uh, once myself, Tim and Les took the first team, there's only one thing that's ever going to happen when you're a first team manager. 1.1 1 .1 year was the average amount of time that a first team manager is employed for. So you're going to get the sack. So you're two points of the Champions League, which we were sacked. Seven months out of work, the longest, horriblest time ever. So, first month is brilliant, box sets, 
Doritos, kicking your shoes off, whatever. Brilliant. In the end, that was too, too, too much. Fortunately for me, John Peacock asked me to coach to England on the 17th for two tournaments during that time. And that, that sort of you know, helped me to stay safe. Went to, went to uh, QPR as head of coaching. Um, head of coaching, uh, then obviously became a manager. Then I was a senior uh, phase coach, so you can see how I was moving around the club. Back in the day, and then this is comes, comes at the end, back in the day between Luton and Barnet, why I was uh, basically um, working at, working at Barnet, and I was moonlighting, I was an agent for a year. Hated it. The worst job you can do, unless you get big time players. So what happens is, is you might think, why is that a development job? Well, I think it's a development job. But players want to know what you can do for them. My standard answer was pass it to your own man, and you might get another club. Simple. So a lot of times, players want you to, to they, they think the agent gets them the job. No, the agent doesn't get, it doesn't get the job. They get the job themselves. The agent facilitates the brokerage in between. So a lot of times, that, that was a horrible job. So that's why I moved later the morning. And then I gave it up because it was, it was, I just couldn't deal with the, the, the expectation of the young players. Now, in order to make sure that your development and these development roles right, are current, and you're not just saying in my day, I started in 1978. In 1978, well, that is, I mean, that is so far away from what uh, the young players can even envisage now. Um, I mean, when I started, there wasn't even video recorders in those days. So imagine what the technology we have now. It's so far away. Now, I've got to make sure whatever happens, I have to keep up with the times as well. But to make sure that you're not just saying, in my day, this happened and that happened. So you look at this end there in 1970, that was Italy, that World Cup was Italy versus Brazil. It was the first colour World Cup final. It was the first time it was in colour. Now, I don't know some of you for young boys won't actually comprehend that TV was in black and white before. You know, you see those black and white pictures in the, in the in these uh, fancy shops. The TV was like that, there was no colour. That was that was the first one. That was the first one I actually remember at eight, nine years of age. And through, through the years, obviously, the World Cups, things have changed. Now, why I put this on now is the grass is still green, the ball's still round. The principles are staying the same, but you have to stay in touch with what's going on at any given time. So, once we formulate once we, once we started formulating the philosophy that we spoke about before with uh, John McDermott, Alex Eaglethorpe, Perry Suckley, Richard Allen, um, and all the other coaches, all the other coaches that were there. The first thing is first, what we, what we used to talk about with John was obviously people, the same age groups, are at different development stages. So, we, whenever you see me present, these slides, these slides have always come up because they're in my heart, they're, 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 they're things that, that I believe. If you look at the, the date at the top, right? when we did that, this slide we did in 2005, <laughs> then this to 2017, so it's ended 18 months ago, was the plan. Well, I left a little bit earlier, but that was the plan. So this is what we looked at as a, as a, as a, as a um, how long it takes for people to get into the, into the team. So when when we looked at it before, in my day, you were getting in the team at 18. Now people get make their debuts later. So we knew that that was something that was happening and gonna happen. And uh, it's easy to put this on the retrospective. Oh, we knew. But you can, well, why I've put you the original the original slide up is to show you that that is what that was the plan. 12 years. Now. We didn't know we were going to be there, but we're saying, we're saying.
same, but that's that is pointless having two year plan. Because you have to recruit top end for that to happen. Okay? So what we did first of all, we looked at a strength based program. So what we're looking at is the individual. What can you do? We're not saying to you, most of the times when people we sign people, they get released on what they can't do. Why did you sign them? You sign them for what they can do. When you go and watch someone, you don't you don't tick the box off saying he can't edit, he can't run, he can't turn. No, you say he can dribble, he can shoot, he can do this, he can do that. They should not leave the club based on things like what that you now decide they can't do. They can't leave the club being worse at what you sign them for. That can't happen. So we look at a strength-based uh, uh, um, program, and if they have things that we think are fundamental to their job that are going to hold them back, then we'll work on it. But we won't start working on things that they can't do because well, there's no point. There's no point in that. So when you're working with a team. It is pointless, uh, we were talking earlier about, um, about teams. If I'm working with QPR in the Premier League and they're having a bad time and we go, we, our, but my ethos is to play through the midfield and have rotation and, and go 1v1, then I'm mad. Because I'm not looking at working to the strengths of the team or the capabilities of the team. If I'm Pellegrini, which was the coach opposite me at that time, and I had the players that I've got, I can do what I want, can't I? I can leave people up, I can rotate, I don't need to worry about players. Because we have a technical and a physical mismatch. My materials are better than your materials. I can impose my philosophy much easier than you can impose yours. So you have to look at what the teams, do, what the teams can do and how, what, what's going to be their strengths. So if I've got Bobby Zamora, who wins 9 out of 10 headers, I've got to use his strength for the team. And I'm, then I've got to decide what's, what's going to be better. If I've got a different scenario, like when we, we were at Tottenham, and we had the likes of Christiansen and the Tomlins and people like that, I can rotate and play through the midfield. It's, it's easy. So I know if we go to Benfica, we're level with you. We can play our game. We don't have to worry about you. We'll worry about your, about your, 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 uh, your strengths, of course. We're not stupid, but we are going there to win the game. Whereas if, if I'm a QPR playing against Liverpool at Anfield, I'm really going there really to try to see if I can smash them around. So you have to look at you have to look at look at where you are. You have to, this is now realistic. So we formed the development pyramid and we look, looked at it, because you're dealing with kids, you have to look at it in, in, in the same way that you look at a school. At the end, the stream technique. Stream technique is you go to a primary school, you learn everything at the beginning, don't you? You learn everything, you become good as much as, much, as many things as you can. So as we move up, movement experimentation. Movement experimentation means that the pitches are getting bigger, there's now a shape, a more defined shape. So players play in different, different areas. Too many times, players end up becoming a fullback. Uh, we had it with a, a kid called Jack Bartram. He was a right back under 10, and he was a right back at under 18. So he never did the. Now that's our fault. That's our fault. What, why, why are we doing that? He needed different experiences. Luckily for us, he got. He, he, he became a pro. But how many kids did we fail by making them into a fullback or a centre half at 11 and never trying them anywhere else? Movement refinement means that as we know, as, as the, we, we look at the growth spurts, people start having characteristics that move them into different parts of the pitch. People have uh, Stephen Corker and Tom Carroll. Tom Carroll can, can have his, his, his movement via experimentation. He's never going to be a centre half. Stephen Corker is never going to be a number 10, but he's had, the, he's had the, the, the opportunity to play there for us to, to start deciding at six foot four and not very nimble, you're not going to play there. Okay? But, uh, but you're going to be fantastic at the back. Okay? Positional refinement. Why we, we do that is because at this stage, they have to go in, as we talked before, they have to go in with an identity. When, they, when you sign uh, your squatters, you usually sign a team or the, or the skeleton of a team. You're not going to sign 
five left wingers because they won't get any game time. So you fight you so you so you're looking at move, uh, movement refinement. And now, however you do it, it could be that someone is a defender, but you're not sure if they're going to be a left back or a centre half, or they could be a centre forward, but you're not sure if they're going to go wide. But they've got a di an identity, the part of the pitch they're going to play. When we talk about developing expertise, is when they come in, they come in full time. So um, and you're looking at more bespoke, even in proficient position with firemen, you're looking at more bespoke training. You're looking at, as they come through the door, their identity is sort of known, most of them, 80% of them, their identity is known. So you now have to make them much more of an expert in what they're, what, they're, what, they're doing, what they're doing. You have to make sure that you chop all those rough edges off. And an expert, we always talk about anyone who goes and plays football, whether they play for QPR or play for Staines, if they have made a financial contribution to their to their to their uh, their life and it's they're playing for three points, they have reached expert stage. Now people say, not an expert who plays for plays for Rochdale. There's only four around about four hundred and forty people that play in that league. So first if you look at if you look at the uh, Premier League, what is it? Every starting every week, twenty-two players in what nine games. It's not a lot of people. Same with, with, with the championship, same with the other two, the other the other two leagues. There are not that many people playing in it. No matter how bad you think people are, given every sat any Saturday, thousand footballers roughly are, are standing in front of those crowds. So you might think he can't do this and do that. Week in, week out, these players playing for these teams, Fleet Woods, you know, uh, uh, um, Morecams, teams like that. They are elite players. They are experts. Now, elite is slightly different. So you're looking at five different stages of elite. And ultimately, you're looking at, you look at your salary football, then you look at your championship, you look at your Premier League, and then you're looking at world class. So, there's different stages of where we want to be. Okay? So, it's important that you, what, you believe in your philosophy. Your philosophy has to be adaptable. So, you have to believe in it, you have to believe in the players, you have to, believe, you have to, have, you have to argue their case, you have to be able to convince the people that, are, that, are, that you're arguing with, and they have to have the courage to play the players. Now, success therefore should be judged accordingly. So if you're looking at this picture, how do we judge success? If that ball goes in, is it successful or not successful? If he saves it, is it successful or not successful? So, first and foremost, if that's taken two weeks ago, he might not be in that position because he might not have been able to, 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 to have that shape. He might not have been able to get his hand now. If he touches it and it goes in, is that success or not success? Depends where you are. Depends where you are. So success has to be judged accordingly. So therefore, we look at the individual. So in our pyramid, the individual is the most important. The least important is the result, at this, at the, at the, when, depending where you are in the pyramid. In first thing, having been there, the least important is the individual. The most important is the result. Now the performance is always important, but the reason I say that, fans only want to win games, and chairman only want to win games. If you play for Arsenal, and you win the game, not one, well, play Real Madrid, you win the game in not good performance, people are not happy. So there you have to affect their full performance. If you don't play the player that costs 100 million, then your chairman wants to know. But not the other way around. If you're the first person, you have to win. So this, this is the way around when you're looking at development and you're looking at, at, at first thing. So if, if for us, it's important to have adaptable coaches. So this is one of our signature, our signature um, um, statements. It's not us, it's Charles Darwin. But it's not the strongest of the species that survives. It's not the most intelligent. It's the most adaptable to change. So, dinosaurs like me have to keep evolving all the time. 
Not, don't lose your, 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 your principles, but you have to keep evolving. I can't keep saying, in 1978, when I came into it, the ball had a lace in it, but I saw we should still do that. I have to understand what's going for the people that I'm actually working with and coaching. So, we talked about before about the 12 year journey, okay? If you are to adapt, we have to see what's going to happen. So if you're Harry Winks, who we worked with at uh, the 10 or whatever it might be, when I first came in, we might in Yon. Then Randy Ramos, right? So you go Dutch, Spanish. <coughs> then Harry, Harry Bentner to English. Willis Boris, Portuguese. Tim, back to English. And then Pochino. So, so you can't say when you come in, uh, uh, the under nines have to play like the first team, because look how many managers that uh, have changed. You can't change it all the time. Can't change the can't change the, the philosophy all the time. That's why you have to have a development philosophy that is adaptable. So by the time the player comes to Pochino, he's got a set of skills and a set of experiences with that which will allow him to adapt to the coach that's coming in. So, you know, we through this, ne this next bit because we talked about this from the, from the playground to the stadium. Critical importance when you're dealing with first team football, dealing with owners. So, if you want to be a first team coach, you're going to have to deal with owners, you're going to have to deal with people being on Twitter, you're going to have to, you're, you're going to have a, uh, like, like well, our owner, he's very active with, with, uh, with the locals the local uh, fans and the people on social media. Support staff, from 1978, when you had the coach, the assistant manager, the physio, and the kit man, that was your, your staff. Now you've got 10, 15 support staff. So you have to be sure that when you put a philosophy together, you can defend it and you can impart it on your staff that everybody says the same thing. Instead of dealing with four people, now you're dealing with 10, 12 people. Fans. That's why we, that's why we do the game. The game is for, the, for these people. So trying to please these, the, the fans is probably your biggest, your biggest task. And the social media doesn't help. You can get sacked or employed by social media. Because the owners, I hate getting stiff. I hate it. Dressing room dynamics. What's your dressing room dynamics? When you coach kids, you can have the dressing room dynamics are quite similar and you can control them. You can control, control them with your presence, control them with your knowledge, and you can you can help people to get on better. Generation gaps, you don't get them. Coach under 16s, they're within 18 months of each other. <coughs> Coach the first team, you can go from 17 to 36. You can go, people, people, people are completely different, have completely different life experiences. You have to try to jump them together. Modern reporting. Modern reporting is very difficult. Because in the past, you would have a board to go to, and you're, you, you didn't even really know the chairman, and people would give you a chance. <coughs> now you've got to report to the sporting director technical directors, etc. And worse, your mate. Your mate. <coughs> Imagine getting sacked by your mate. So if you've got a, if you've got if you've got a relationship with somebody, you know, uh, where that weekend <coughs> we've probably been out at dinner and then on Tuesday you're getting sacked. And your mate has to tell you. So your relationships with people, how do you maintain professional relationships and friendships and still move on and still keep them intact. Probably the most difficult thing. Okay, so watch this. This is one week, last minute, three, two. Okay, last minute. Now, a minute before that, a minute before that, I was, I was, we've been winning 2-0, no, we've been losing 2-0, we've got it back. We got it back to 2-2, two, two. but it was a home game and we should have really won because we managed to come down, whatever. Boo! You don't know what you're doing and all that. So we, we play that, you play on. Last kick of the game, we win the game. Chaired off the pitch. Okay? Right. 
This is a week later. Brought on the same sub, gives the ball away. Okay? Last minute. We're winning the game. See ya. Now, next minute, you're, you're, you're having to explain. You're having to explain why you're useless. Right? So, the week before, in my, my, my week was defined by two kicks of the ball. By two kicks of the ball. That's what my week was defined by. Right? Effect on your career. So if you want to go into basketball, football, you've got to realise that you, you can be the best coach in the world. Two kicks of the ball in a week have gone from being unbelievable, um, player, uh, coach of the month nominee, to speculation about his job within a week. Making the same substitution. So you've got to understand that first team football is so fickle. You may never, you, you may never ever get to grips with it, no matter who you are. So, having said that, ultimate job, we'll go back to that question. Who's, uh, who's, 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 someone throw one out, what's your ultimate job? I thought manager. Manager, or? <laughs> no, I thought Huh? I thought manager, I thought what I saw. <laughs> <laughs> who else? Ultimate job. Probably head of development. Fantastic, good, good. Anybody else? Okay, all that has been said, all your history, all your knowledge, what is your ultimate job? Well, well I've got the ultimate job. To help every coach in the club and affect every squad in the club. And that's my schedule. So, if you look at my schedule, right? Work with the first team, in the first team brief, debrief on a Monday, see if they want me, if they don't want me, I'll work with the 23s. Normally, the under 18, the under 23s play a game on Monday. If it's an away game, I'll work with the under 18s. Because they, they work in the afternoons, because they have education. Then in the evening, it's foundations 9 to 11, so I'll, I'll go and work with one of those groups. Tuesday, depending, on, on, on what? Normally, the, fir the, the, the first team on the 23th, depending on what. Tuesday afternoon, we have clinics with the younger players who in the first team squad. We have clinics with them. In the, in the evening, youth development, I'll take one of the teams, 12 to 16. Wednesday off, should be should be off, but you get, to be fair, you go, you go in sometimes because you think it's going to burn down if you're not there. But it, it is, but that's what you do. First team, with a 20, uh, on, on Thursday, it's more than 23 because they're getting ready for the game, right? In the evening, back to, 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 the, youth, to the youth development phase. Friday is always with the first team. Friday afternoons, academy meetings. If it's a home game, I'll go with the 18s in the morning or the 16s. Go to the first team game in the afternoon and do, sit with the analyst and do the bit down to the bench. Sundays, every other Sunday I, get, I don't go in, but every other Sunday I go and watch. One, one, uh, so once a month I'll go with uh, the foundation to watch one of their games uh, or the, the, uh, the youth development phase. <laughs> so that's, that's my ultimate job. Yeah. I think there's no job like that in the world. So. Fortunately, fortunately for me, the journey that I've, I've had and enjoyed that journey has got me to a job. I don't think you can, you, could, you can write this job description because two reasons. One, longevity. When I was at Tottenham, 10 years, very few people will work with a player at under nine and still work with that same player in the first day. That, that's very, very rare. Well, I don't think it happens. And that's not because I'm good and, 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 and that's the reason, that's luck. Because what happens is a lot of the times, when clubs change, which I showed you all the managers, usually people change as the club changes. Fortunately, 
uh, John McDermott stayed, and um, but he's still there, and we we worked together all, all through that through that time. That's luck rather than rather than being good at anything. This has been that longevity as well, so I've been here now four years. So to evolve into that job is just a slightly lost situation. Somebody leaves at some time and you've, because of your journey, you've been able to engulf a job that people know that you're confident in doing. So, just to wrap up, what arena do you think you're in? So just think about that. Are you in this one? Or are you in this one? And where are your strengths like? That's what you need to think about when we talk about I know it's it, it, uh, where you're going to work, who you're going to work with. And if you understand where your strengths lie, then you, 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 you'll, be, you'll be closer to getting to the peak of where your career um, should be for you, or where you can help the players and be happy the most. Thank you.